Today we're going to be talking about release work. Hi, and welcome to The Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Casey Marie Hurt, and today we're going to be looking at release work. Today we're going to be exploring some occipital release work as well as release work for the jaw. Now this isn't just important for people who are migraine sufferers or people who clench their teeth or have neck and shoulder issues, um, but it's also really important to understand the evolutionary component of how we've evolved from monkeys and how important and how profound the musculature of the jaw and occiput has really informed us coming up into upright position as humans. So uh, when we were apes roaming the jungle um, and climate change happened, uh, we had to go into the woodlands of Africa to start to look for food. Now, a couple things happened in that time frame. First, there's some big game there. So we all of a sudden uh, became very much prey, <laughs> um, just as much as a predator, right? And so from this, we went from apes that hung out in trees and in jungles who ate really starchy roots and tubers. Um, so when you eat that type of roughage, right, the jaw muscles have to work really, really hard to continue to chew, and it could take a really long time uh, to get that uh, that form of sustenance from the roots. So as as the apes started to go into Africa, the food source changed a little bit. First of all, they started eating meat, and that's because they could go into the kill sites of, say, a lion and eat some of the remnants of that. Also, because of um, fish and mollusks, they could really get that form of food pretty easily without it being so dangerous. So even smaller, you know, younger apes could go to the side of a river, stream, or the ocean and start to forage the, the animal protein there. So through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of this happening, a few things started to shift to get the apes to go into this upright position. Because the jaw muscles didn't have to work so hard at chewing roots, what happened is, is where the attachment point on apes of the cervical spine is at the back of the skull, because the jaw muscles started to reform, that attachment point started getting lower and lower and lower as to where it is right now, just from not chewing as many roots and tubers. Now, the other thing that happened also is that we started to use tools more to start tenderizing meat, which is pretty phenomenal. So that again, if you think about connective tissue, if any of you are cooks out there, right? Some of the connective tissue can be very, very dense and tough. Again, increasing chew time. But now, because the apes were a little bit more out of the trees onto the ground, using their hands a little bit more to get food, then they could tenderize the meat and again chew less. And this amazing thing happened where as they chewed less, their occipital area started to drop down, which then gave less compression to the skull, which allowed it to get larger, to house our larger brain that is then fed with animal protein and fish protein and mammal protein, which again, fed a larger brain. So through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of this, this is how the ape started to turn into a more upright um, a homo species, right? Homo sapiens. It's pretty amazing to think about it that way. So now that we know that the jaw muscles have been such an important piece of how we become upright as humans, we can see how much really start to understand how much it affects our skeleton as a whole. Now, people don't chew their food enough now. That's a huge problem in digestion. Even the, the, the 
the amylase that's in our saliva is now shifting because of the different types of food that we're eating. It's, it's just phenomenally interesting. So what we want to do is start to open up the jaw muscles and the occiput here to help balance the spine, the shoulder girdle, and the torso. This is so important to proper dynamics of the, the spine as the whole, and also, again, for our migraine sufferers, for our tension headache people, for people with sinus pressure, people with lymphatic drainage problems. This is essential to help unlock the top of the spine and find a little bit more freedom in the jaw. Um, and I know this personally, for me, I have TMJ, so this is something that I work on a lot, but we wanna get our little jaw guy to move easy and free so that all of the musculature at the back of the head can open up so that we can have this really beautiful upright positioning that really is our birthright. Now, let's get into some movement with this. And here at the studio, we're really, um, let's get this guy back on there, there we go. We really like to use lots of different props. And even when our props seem to malfunction, we figure out different ways to, to utilize them. So this is our beloved green spiky balls. And when they come to pass, they usually break in two. Now what we do is we finish, we finish them off by cutting them open so that we can have these little release work nubs. Now we use these in lots of different ways. Um, and what I like about these is that you can use the spiky part, which is very, very nice for the skin and the connective tissue, or you can invert it so that it can be smooth for somebody who's a little bit more tender. Now, I think that using this half foam roller is a wonderful cervical pillow. So I'm gonna show you how to use these to help release the back of the occiput in the jaw. Now, I'm gonna lay down onto this nice half foam roller, and even here, it's nice to just roll from right to left, opening up that occipital tissue that can get so tough. Think about it, right? There are eight occipital muscles, and there are some of them as uh, densely active muscle fibers in your entire body, and it's because, essentially, they're balancing a bowling ball on top of a sliver of a golf ball, right? And so what we wanna do is ease that up. So I'm gonna take these two release work half green spikies, and I lifted up my hair so that I could get them really at that occipital area. And then I'm gonna use this nice little hump of the half foam roller to press into that tissue. And this just feels like a dream. If you've ever had cranial sacral work done, this is like a still point pillow, which helps to open up those facets um, at the back of the head and helps to release pressure in the dura, in the scalp, the shoulders, and the jaw. So you can do tiny little movements. And I like having the spikies there because it kind of holds on to the fascia, the superficial fascia in the skin, and then I move my bones underneath it. So it creates a pulling and sliding of that fascia, of that soft tissue on the bone. So you can go up and down, you can roll side to side, or you can just rest and practice a breathing meditation to help lower your head onto the release work points. Now, another thing that you can do with these is you can even go into some sideline work at the area of the temple. And this is really where some of your jaw muscles live. So you can place it right at the temple in front of there. You can open and close the jaw. You can roll from right to left. You can put two of them down. This is where you and your clients are your own first person expert at where you can start to release tension. Here I have it right above the ears. Very nice place to rock from side to side, opening that up, up and down. Now another thing that you can do is get into the SCM or the sternocleidomastoid and start to get that tissue right at the bottom of the skull, right behind the ear. This can be a very tense area for people rolling from right to left. 
And funny enough, you want to have your allergy sufferers or sinus sufferers do this position, this release work point often because there's some there's a large lymph node called the water wheel there that helps to clear the sinus passages. This can be very, very helpful for your uh, allergy sufferers. And then also with this point, so you can also do the jaw. So I'm going right where the cheekbone meets the jaw. I'm going to find a slack open mouth to get into that divot. And again, I can do little jaw movements, rocking forward and back to help release this tension. Again, this isn't just important for uh, migraine sufferers or headache sufferers, but really because of our culture and how focused we are on sitting down, on computers, on our smartphones, we've really lost, again, this birthright uprightness and tension-free area of the jaw and the head and the occiput that really is such a part of what makes us human and what really leads to health, vitality, and a long open spine. Today we have a question from Jacqueline and it's about hip popping during exercise. And um, this is such a great question because this is something that happens very often in lots of different exercises in the Pilates studio. So she was wondering why does it happen, where is it coming from, and what are some good parameters in which to work around it. So I am somebody who has hip popping during different exercises and for me it's because it's a combination of having a, a lateral deviation and a scoliosis in the spine uh, which is really in the pelvis and down into the legs too and having a weak SI joint. Now now, hip popping can come from a number of different places. Uh, a lot of times uh, it can be, again, like I said in my case, a, a movement or a popping of an SI joint. So one side of the pelvis is stable or, or too stable or it's stuck and the other side is trying to make up for the lack of mobility on the other side. Sometimes it can actually be the femur inside of the acetabulum that has a little crack or a little pop. Um, and, or for some, it might sound like it's coming from the hip, but it might be coming from the low back. So first and foremost, the thing that you wanna do if someone has habitual hip popping is actually send them to their doctor just to have it checked out um, it's this adage that a dear friend of mine always gave me, which, why speculate when you can know? We want to make sure that we do no harm when we're working with our clients. So first things first is just have them go get a quick checkup, have them emulate the popping for, for, their, uh, for their doctor, just to make sure that it isn't anything like a, a torn labrum or something that you want to shy away from. The other thing um, that you want to make sure of is that if it's happening, it, there should be no pain associated with it. Anytime there's a hip pop and pain or um, anything like that, you, that's a red flag. We stop right there, um, you switch gears or send them home because you really don't want to exasperate the, so, you know, any of those issues. You want to be really careful and treat the body with the uh, utmost respect and care and pain is always, always a stop indicator. Again, from that point, you would send them to their doctor so that they can see really what's going on. The whole thing is that we can guess what's happening in the body, but it's very, very hard to tell. Um, so what I would do if it was hip popping that has been checked out is okay and isn't accompanied by pain is I would do a lot of release work around the pelvis and the femur so that I could really create some clear differentiation and movement between those two areas. The other areas I would do is a lot of hamstring opening, pelvic floor opening, low back opening, just to get the whole lumbopelvic area nice and supple and have a, a, an easier range of motion. Uh, sometimes supine work, not very good for the body um, with hip popping, especially if it's SI joint popping. Putting pressure on the sacrum and then saying doing something like legs and springs on the Cadillac, that's a very high lever um, to be, have to hinge on, especially if you're having a hard time organizing the back part 
of the sacrum on the lumbar spine. So I would shorten the levers, maybe do instead of uh, feet and straps, I would put it lower on the body, uh, more above the knee, so that they can experiment with finding ranges of motion, but not at the sake of pulling on the connective tissue of the pelvis. Um, then again, maybe not as much supine work, maybe a lot of four point kneeling, sideline work, so that you can have, give the pelvis all the freedom in the world to do all of these little micro movements to start to learn how to organize the pelvis, the sacrum, and the lumbar spine together in harmony and not going into that point where all of a sudden you start losing joint integrity and start really going into that popping. So I would say as a rule, if you have a poppy client, work them right up to the pop, but go no further really experiment with release work, get a lot of multifidi recruitment, a lot of pelvic floor opening, release work around the pelvis, and only working in areas where you don't hear that popping so you don't ag aggravate the connective tissue in the area. I hope that helps. That's all for today, and if you have a question that you'd like to see answered on an upcoming episode, please comment below on Facebook, Twitter, or our forum. See you next time, and never stop learning.